Well, just to remind you where we are, uh, we are in the midst of a seven-week series on the book of Galatians. We did have a long reading today. Next week will be shorter. Um, And uh, we're going to continue to read every verse of the book of Galatians um, as we engage in this series. Father Bob did a great job last week of setting the stage of what Paul is about in this very important letter. I'm going to pick up um, where we are today, and uh, we'll see where we get um, with this today. But I wanted to just remind you a little bit about this series, and the, the theme is freedom, right? Freedom in Christ. I've got a great, look at that. I don't even have to tell you. It's right there. Oh, this is fantastic. Um, Paul is all about freedom, and he is preaching a freedom in Christ because of grace. We're saved by faith, and um, this is a holy freedom. It's freedom from sin and from bondage. There's a, a great praise song that goes with that. Maybe we'll pick that up sometime during this series as well. Last week we heard about Paul beginning to sort of defend himself. He's being attacked as an apostle, he feels like, uh, to the community in Galatia. And he goes all the way back sort of to the beginning of his calling. And so uh, I'm going to give you some dates and some context. I want to remind you that Paul is writing this letter about the year 54. Bob said last week, so we're going to go with that today. Around the year 54 uh, is a good year to date this book. And he is... Uh, remembering things that have happened before this. So I'm going to mention some places and some dates, but remember he's writing to the Galatians around the year 54. So here's a quick recap of Galatians chapter 1. Paul is very frustrated that people keep challenging his authority as an apostle, and in this main section he continues that defense. So he's going to go through the entirety of his ministry up to this point. Remember Paul has this dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus. This happens about the year 36. He has that vision of Jesus, why are you persecuting me? Um, And then he begins to change his understanding of who he is and begins to figure out that God is calling him to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to a particular group of people we're going to call the Gentiles. Uh, It's not a derogatory term, although sometimes it is used that way in the New Testament. Basically, if you're a Gentile, it means you're not born of Jewish heritage. Uh, You're not born into following the law of Moses. So after a period of time, uh, about three years, Paul goes and he mentions in this, this chapter two, He has some meetings with people, and then he he goes, and and about 14 years later, about the year 49, Paul has already finished round one of his missionary journey. Um, He's gone from Antioch to Cyprus to Asia Minor, Turkey, back to Antioch, and he's gone to sort of uh, check in and report. He says, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't running this this race in vain, right? And so he goes to Jerusalem. This is the famous Jerusalem conference. Uh, where the pillars of Christianity, James and Peter, Cephas, Peter and Cephas are the same person, and John, and this is James and John, the the two brothers. He he meets with them, and and everything seems good, right? In fact, uh, you're doing a good job, Paul. Take Barnabas back with you. He's going to be your right-hand guy. Continue to do what you have been doing. Uh, We think the gospel is for the Gentiles. You're doing great. And so Paul's relaying all this to the the Galatians, who, of course, are of of that group, the Gentiles. And he begins his second missionary journey, about the year 49 or so. And about the year 50 in Antioch, this is an important location for Paul and for for the spread of Christianity, Peter comes up. And basically, (laughs) they have a fight. This is an important fight, and that's really what we're going to talk about today, is how do we as Christians fight with one another in a productive way? So you're going to go home and talk about how you can fight with each other, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so Peter comes up, and basically Peter, Peter's kind of had his own conversion to understanding that the gospel is for Gentiles. Remember back in, in Acts uh, chapter 10, we did a, a preaching series earlier in the Easter season on Acts, and, and Peter has this vision of the animals being lowered from heaven, and a voice, get up, kill, and eat. No, 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 I've never eaten anything unclean. Peter Get up, kill him. No, 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 three times. And then the people from Cornelius come. Cornelius is a Roman centurion who's a a God-fearer. And Peter gets, aha, I get it. Now I understand. God shows no partiality. 
The gospel is not only for Jews, but it's for everybody, right? So Peter's already kind of had his own conversion experience. But we have really three factions here in the early uh, first century of, of Christianity. We've got James, who really, he's not completely on board with this idea. He really thinks if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you first need to be a Jew. You need to follow the law of Moses. And Peter, who's going to waffle back and forth, and Paul is kind of, uh, Paul's the progressive. How about that? You like that? Wow, how about, all right. So, so Peter's had this, this, his own conversion, and so when he is up in Antioch, hanging out with all the, the Gentiles up there, he's eating with them, he's hanging out with them, until a group from Jerusalem comes up. Uh, it's sort of like, a, I think of this as like a Star Wars group, the circumcision faction, right? I mean, like, what, what do we call that group? What a, what a title. But they come up from James to kind of check out what's going on in Antioch. They know that, that Peter's up there and that Paul's been doing his work. And as soon as they arrive... Peter's like, I can't eat with you guys anymore, sorry. Basically, he's being a hypocrite. He's saying, everything was fine as long as James, who kind of has the authority down in Jerusalem, doesn't know what I'm doing, but I don't, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm kind of going back and forth. And Paul calls BS. <laughs> but Paul calling him out doesn't go very well. Paul opposes Peter to his face and says, man, you are being a hypocrite. You have had this conversion experience. You understand that the gospel is for the Gentiles. But as soon as these guys showed up, you started start to turn your back and you're doing your own thing. Now, he stands up to Peter, but nobody's there with him, right? Everybody kind of goes with Peter. He's the elder statesman. He's the guy who's kind of a leader. Even Barnabas, Paul's right-hand guy, kind of goes with him. And so poor Paul is standing there in his conviction that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only for Jews, it's for everybody. And it's for Gentiles. And he comments that you guys in Galatia, I'm writing this, I'm remembering this event that's happened four years ago. I did this for you, right, in Antioch. This is an event that's happened in the past where he's writing to the church in Galatia. And he's saying, I loved you, Gentiles so much that I was willing to stand up for the truth of the gospel for you all by myself, even when everyone stood aside. So from this second chapter, it's the beginning of the second chapter of Galatians, Paul teaches us something really important, and that's how we can have healthy disagreements with one another. We can learn how to have civil and productive conversations, even when we have different perspectives on things where we can still remain in community with one another, remain in faithful unity in Christ. Basically, what Paul is teaching us here is how to have a fight without damaging the body of Christ. And this is a message that we desperately need to hear, and we have a profound opportunity as the church to show as a model for the rest of the world. You all know in the country we live in, America is such a great place, but we can't talk about anything with any controversial issue without people coming almost to blows, certainly verbal, and then we don't know how to be in relationship with people that disagree with us. And so we have here in Galatians a model for how we can have disagreements with each other, and believe it or not, grace can still abound. So I want to walk through how this happens, how Paul sets this model for us, and hopefully will be an encouragement to us as we leave this place um, today. There's three things about graceful disagreement that we can learn from Paul. Number one is that Paul disagrees with Peter face to face. It's really important. He doesn't do it behind his back. He doesn't do it in a passive aggressive way. He doesn't send an email or a Facebook message. He does it right to his face. He gets in his face and he says, what you're doing is wrong, and here's why, okay? We've already learned from Jesus the importance of this. Jesus, uh, way back in, in Matthew's gospel, um, is going to remind us that when a member of the church hurts you, you're supposed to go to that person directly, right? And then if they don't listen, then you're supposed to take one or two with you, and then if they don't listen, then you're supposed to take it to the whole church. And if they still don't listen, Jesus says, treat them like a tax collector and a Gentile. And remember what Jesus did with the tax collectors. He ate with them. And remember what he did for the Gentiles. He sent Paul. 
So that's not the end, right? It, it keeps going. If someone offends you, you need to find a way to be at peace with one another. That's why we share the peace every Sunday when we come together. Jesus also says, if you're going to give your gift at the altar, but remember that you have something between your brother and sister, leave your gift, go and be reconciled, and then come and give your gift. Disagreements need to happen face to face. And we learn that from Paul in his model today and how he confronts Peter. The second thing we learn is that sometimes when we are convicted of the truth of something and we confront someone about it, it can feel like we are all alone in that. Right? Paul here is relaying to the Galatians that he's had this conflict with Peter for their own sake, even as his close companion and partner Barnabas has seemed to take the other side. But Paul understands that this isn't some minor issue. This is of utmost importance. If the gospel is not for the Gentiles, what's the point? If the good news of Jesus Christ is not for the whole world, but only for a small group of people, Paul says, what's the point? This is a big deal, and he is willing to stand up and to lose friendship and to lose political favor and to lose face in order to stand up for the truth. This is something uh, that's difficult uh, for many of us to do. Um, oftentimes, we might have a particularly strong conviction about something, but if it's challenged by a friend or a family member or by someone we think has influence or power, we might compromise that. Thomas Jefferson was the champion at this, right? I have very strong convictions about this thing, but if you disagree with me, I will compromise them immediately. I lived in Virginia for five years, so that's, I'm bringing a little bit of that here. This never happens in Texas, but there is a danger that we all face, that if we know something to be right and true, are we willing to stand up for it, even if it costs us something? even if it costs us someone being displeased with us? And for Paul, the answer is absolutely yes. Because, number three, this disagreement is about something very important. It's of utmost significance. It's of eternal consequence, okay? Paul knows that this is the line in the sand. This is something worth disagreeing with the leadership over. This is important. It's not about the color of the carpet, okay? This is for real. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to get really upset about things that don't matter. <laughs> um, I think things in worship and in our church polity are a big deal because they have to do with God. In fact, uh, Father Bob and I were at a Eucharist service earlier this year. And I got really, really disappointed and upset about some liturgical decisions that were made that I disagreed with. Now, but they were not of eternal significance. They were, maybe someone was forgetful or had just made some different decisions that I would choose not to make. They weren't important enough to bring directly to that person, and so I should just let it go. Paul models for us when something is so significant that it needs to be addressed, that we should do that. But otherwise, we should find ways to get along with each other. Ultimately, in the Christian church, God wants all of us to be united in love and in grace and the freedom we have in Jesus Christ, Paul models for us a way to engage with each other about things we might disagree about. Paul offers us a model that we can present to the world for how to be in conversation about things while remaining united. Paul addresses Peter directly. He stands up for what he believes in even when he is alone and he does so over something that is of eternal significance, not over something minor. Now, we don't really know from the New Testament what happens to Peter and Paul after this. However, church tradition ascribes that both Peter and Paul together taught and spread Christianity in Rome, that most important city. I like to think about the two of them kind of doing that work together after this incident that's happened that they were reconciled together. The, the author of 2 Peter ascribes Paul's letters as scripture. So today, when you think about church in Galatia, 
Think about Peter and Paul and the conflict that they experience. I hope that you will remember that God's grace abounds even when we disagree. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day and the opportunity we have to read and pray and meditate through Paul's letter to the Galatians. We thank you for the model he sets for us on how to have healthy disagreements. Lord, help us to take our disagreements to people directly, face to face. Help us to stand firm in the things you've convicted us that are of significance in this life and in your kingdom. Lord, thank you for the unity we experience in Christ our Savior. And in his name we pray. Amen.